Well, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Talk of the Tundra, your Green Bay Packers podcast that is a proud partner of the Eurostep Podcast Network, Network and the Blue Wire family. As always, I'm your host, Numak, coming to you with the most important news of the day. That is obviously the trade deadline for the NFL. Uh, comes and goes at 4 o'clock uh, today. I heard a rumor that the uh, Chicago Bears did not stay in line. Uh, they decided that they were not in the uh, Marshawn Lattimore sweepstakes. Oh. And to discuss the Packers move today of <laughs> passing on, or rather sending Preston Smith to the Washington Commanders, is my lovely co-host, Jordan Tresky. Jordan, how are you doing, buddy? I'm good. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You're good. Well, You're good. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, good. This reaction might, we don't know what's happening. Sources say things are happening, but we don't know what's happening. So based on my look of anguish, we we don't know what's going on. But it doesn't matter. I misspoke, uh, so my apologies. He did not get sent to the Washington Command. That's where that's where he used to play. He gets sent to the Pittsburgh Steelers. So I don't know where my brain is. Wait, what? What is going on? Wait, what? I said that Preston Smith was sent to the Washington Commanders like 30 seconds ago in the intro. I thought you said Marshawn Lattimore. No, the Bears, I did. You said the Bears were not in the Marshawn Lattimore. Yeah, I did. And then I said <laughs> I, the whole thing. The, regardless, I got it wrong. And I'm not redoing the intro okay. because that was the good intro. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, and it was so, a good intro. And so I misspoke. The Packers sent Preston Smith to the Pittsburgh Steelers in exchange for a seventh round pick, um, bringing his time to a close uh, in Green Bay. But before we get into that, we are going to briefly hand out the cheeses from <laughs> this past week's uh, Detroit Lions game. It's not going to take very long, I promise. So bear with us for the next two and a half minutes. Uh, first candidate is Josh Jacobs, 13 carries, 95 rushing yards, including uh, two catches and 13 receiving yards. Jaden Reed, five catches on six targets, 113 receiving yards, including a couple of big plays. Emmanuel Wilson, four carries, 28 rushing yards, and a touchdown. Uh, Isaiah McDuffie, five tackles, one tackle for a loss, and 19 snaps. Uh, Rasheed Walker, 65 snaps, and one pressure allowed. Um, two locks here for Jordan and I, obviously, Josh Jacobs and Jaden Reed. Um, I'm almost inspired to not hand out a third, Jordan, versus trying to give a third. Yeah, we can do that. We, we get- are the creators of this podcast we are and we've went the other way and handed out four when there was deserving candidates to to get four i am of the opinion that i don't think there is a a worthy candidate for three i would agree with you i it, i don't want to clutch for straws here you know kudos to emmanuel wilson and isaiah mcduffie in like limited roles but it was still a ugly loss and no one else really stepped up outside of Jacobs and Reed in terms of like long lasting impact. Obviously the Packers lost. So if we give out your two cheeses, we can do that. We make the rules. We do make the rules. The only other like half more. candidate I would have thought about is uh, Aaron Mosby getting his half stack um, along with Rashawn Gary, but I don't think he did enough the rest of the game to really, to really warrant that. So. He played five snaps. Yeah. To, uh, two. Right. So that that's kind of my, my point. Like if yeah. he, he didn't have the Eric Wilson game where it's hyper efficient with multiple big plays mixed in there. He Turkey. only had the, the half sack with uh with Rashawn Gary. So yeah, I think we are keeping it to uh keeping it to two this week, Jordan. Works for me. Perfect. So getting back to Preston Smith, that is the only move the Packers make on the day. Um we'll talk about a little bit of that later before we talk about Goody's press conference, but um as I mentioned, Packers trade Ed Rusher Preston Smith to the Pittsburgh Steelers, a team in the thick of it, um, playoff wise in the AFC North. The uh including his playoff stats, Preston Smith leaves Green Bay with ninety nine uh games played over five and a half seasons after he signed that free agent deal along with Cedarius Smith in twenty nineteen. He recorded forty seven and a half sacks, six forced fumbles, an interception, and two hundred and eighty four tackles. Uh, Tom Silverstein of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported that the Steelers are picking up the remainder of Preston's 1.6 million base salary and his per game roster bonus. And the Packers are now uh, around 16 to 17 million dollars under the cap in 2024. um, Definitely a reduced role and some reduced um, impact as well in his, in his games, 19 tackles, six of which were solo two and a half sacks, which is, 
unfortunately tied for second. Um, 10 pressures, which was fifth on the team, and he played 54 of the defense's total snaps. Um, so I guess uh, let's start there, Jordan. Obviously, Preston being one of the two Smiths that came with Sedarius in that big 2019 class once they hired Matt LaFleur, a veteran in the locker room. This team gets a lot younger now, doesn't really have that veteran leadership because I think Preston was the oldest guy on the team, if I'm not mistaken. Um, outside of That's maybe shame. it changed with Brandon McManus' signing, I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah. And so second oldest guy on the team, a leader for sure, and a guy that was effective last year as well in Rashawn Gary's, or two years ago in Rashawn Gary's extended absence and was effective a little bit last year as well. But um, I think one of the, 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 the facts of this that sort of colorizes this move is uh, Ken Engel is the Packers cap guy, has this uh, for, for cap space over the next four years. Um, the Green Bay Packers trade of, the Pres- of Preston Smith will create, and it's $2 million of cap space this year, $7.5 million of cap space next year, uh, $18.2 million of cap space in 2026, and um, just under $2 million in 2027. So I think from what Goody had said in his press conference, talking about wanting to see Lucas Van Ness get some more run, and then he talked about Bretton Cox Jr. getting more run as well, which I guess we'll see. I was a fan of him in training camp last year, and Hopefully he can continue on his trajectory of being a useful piece off the edge. But I think this move, if anything, was almost certainly motivated by their salary cap issues in the coming in the coming years, knowing that they have Christian Watson to possibly play I'm sorry, to possibly pay Romeo Dobbs to possibly pay. Um, Jaden Reed's going to be extension eligible soon on his rookie deal, and he, they're going to give him a contract at some point because he's obviously their best receiver right now. Same thing with Tucker Kraft. And so that 2026 timeline two years away from now kind of gives them opportunity to start building towards that, that cap space, in my opinion. Yeah, there's the on-field part of it. Obviously, as you mentioned, 54, 54% of the Packers' total defensive snaps, Preston Smith was on the field for. That is the lowest by far since he came to Green Bay. That's one factor to consider here. Two, not really to for him to blame, or not putting this all on him, but you look at the two and a half sacks, I think the most important number is probably the 10 pressures, um, which is kind of shocking based on... Preston Smith just kind of has this like solid, if not spectacular kind of play about him that's just kind of how we've he's always been sturdy yeah i mean like it's it's not flashy it's not like rashawn gary getting three sacks against the saints and like what 23 snaps it was last year you know spot guys getting a run but it's something that you can depend on that just a very well-rounded player obviously up in age but i think it was only last early or off season that the Packers restructured his contract to keep him Green Bay. I think that they, they did it this past off season too. Let's yeah, say, yeah. So back to back off seasons of keeping Preston Smith, they obviously have made. You know, Lucas Van Ness was the thirteenth or whatever number it was first round pick in twenty twenty three as a stopgap, but you know that he's eventually going to be groomed and developed as the next edge rusher opposite sides of Rashawn Gary. This obviously opens up room for him, opens up room for JJ Adigbari, um, who in my opinion is kind of tailor made to really take over that role because I think he, the produ- pro- productivity is there. I think he's made great strides and he might have the more immediate impact. Whereas we're still kind of waiting on Lucas Van Ness to kind of blossom into what the Packers hoped that he could be when they drafted him. But that's kind of the on-field impact of it, of, like, there have been rumblings for weeks, and it wasn't just kind of out of the no- out of nowhere. But considering the return, considering that, you know, I think last game he had 21 snaps, it was pretty much on par with, like, Gary, Anikbari, Lucas Van Ness. It was a, it's a crowded edge rusher room. Never mind the fact that, yeah, the pass rush has not been completely there to say the least, to start the year. But it 
it's not too surprising from that angle. The off the field stuff, as you mentioned, the cap figures and and you know, Packers have a lot of draft picks invested <laughs> that are playing on this roster on this team, and eventually you're gonna have to pay them. Yeah, you know I mean, like it started with Jordan Love. It started with um. It's going to start with the, the 22 guys, whether it's Watson, Dobbs, or you go more into um, – who am I forgetting already? Uh, Reed? Well, no, no, not 22. Or oh, I meant 22. And 22. Um, yeah, like Devontae Wyatt. Wyatt, Quay. Yep. That's topics for another day. But you know what I mean? Like that – Right. They have invested so many so – many, uh, invested in so many draft picks. Yeah, they have a lot of them. That – Fitting out that <laughs> the herd basically to who are we going to pay based on play performance factors, all that stuff. You got to make those decisions really early. Yeah. And the, the having that foresight is really hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really hard for where the Packers are at this point. Yeah. It's, it's probably going to be one of the biggest things that we're going to have to talk about in the off season. Mm-hmm not just this year, but the years to come, because as good as they are right now, things could look very different. And they have a lot of different ways to build build this team and continue shaping it in terms of hopefully becoming a Super Bowl contending roster. Yeah. Talking about the 2022 class, um, we forgot probably the two biggest, uh, possibly the three biggest guys they'll, they'll need to resign or extend. Um, Zach Tom top of that list he's yes. a, he was a fourth round pick that year along with like i mean there's i mean there's a lot of guys in this class like i'm just gonna go through them all honestly because i think leaving some out is unfortunate uh quay walker Devontae wyatt christian watson sean ryan romeo dobbs zach tom jj anikbare um Tariq carpenter isn't with the team anymore neither is jonathan ford um and then rashid walker and samar Toure. so like rashid walker is obviously a third year guy what are they planning yeah. on doing with him you're going to pay Zach Tom like they just are going to. That's what the, what's going to happen. Um, and so then what do you do with two receivers that get a lot of work in the offense? What do you do with uh, your two first-round picks? Like we talked, had the Quay discussion a little bit earlier uh, this season, I think this past uh, game against the Lions. Devontae Wyatt, too, who hasn't really had a chance to really show out the way he needed to. There's a lot of decisions coming up for Brian Gutekunz because he's been drafting so well. And so it's it's like a it's a it's a double edged sword. You you have, I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eleven picks, and what you want to say? There's conservatively six of them turn out. Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, Zach Tom, Rashid Walker, Sean Ryan, and Devonte. <laughs> like you could you can't say Quay. He's been the starter for two and a half years, so. I mean, that, that's just the price you pay when you draft so well. You can't pay all the guys, and you got to have some roster turnover somewhere. And so, um, it would make it this, this makes sense with the, those decisions coming down the line and clearing out eighteen million dollars in cap space in twenty twenty six is is a good for the is good for the team while getting back a seventh round pick, which isn't really anything. Like they might find a diamond in the rough, like they did with Rashid Walker, like they did with. I think Evan Williams was a fourth round pick, if I'm not mistaken. So that was he was, yeah. And so, if anything, it might get you uh, Malik Willis, which is what the Packers paid to get him. Yep. Or but that's or Keaton Oladapo, who's on the practice squad. Like he he showed some good flashes, and so it just depends on what they can find there. Like they're, I think it's a crapshoot regardless of when you draft seventh round picks. But if they can get, if they can get guys like you said, like Malik Willis, I don't think that that's a a bad thing to do or even like if they find a, a veteran that they want to trade for in the future for a seventh rounder like you know what i mean like i think that's um i mean it, it's next year's seventh round pick so it's not that big of a deal but you know what i'm trying to say yeah so um with that being said that is the only move they make today um they end up not getting help at corner marshawn Lattimore uh goes to why am I forgetting it? Washington. Washington. That's where I probably got Washington was, was that move. Um, goes to Washington in a, in a good situation there. I did not see the full return. What was the... Um, I'm assuming it was a premium. It wasn't super. Um, Marshawn Lattimore traded to uh, Washington along with a uh, 
2025 fifth round pick uh, for the Commanders 2025 third, 2025 fourth, and 2025 sixth. So I'd say pretty decent, but like not blowing my socks off kind of deal. Packers definitely could have made it if they wanted to. But the cap situation for them would have been extremely messy. So yes. that was never really going to happen in the first place. Um, other moves today that, that were reported, uh, Khalil, Herbert, Khalil Herbert is traded to the Bengals from from Chicago for a seventh. Uh, Jonathan Mingo is traded to Dallas from Carolina for a seventh. I'm sorry. Mingo was traded for, with a seventh for a fourth, um, which is absolutely crazy. Just crazy. Crazy bad decision by, by Jerry Jones. Um, Mike, William, Mike Williams is traded from the Jets to the Pittsburgh Steelers for 2025 fifth round pick. Um, tackle Khalid Davis was traded to San Francisco from Houston for a, a seventh round pick in 2026. And then Tredavious White, the former Buffalo Bill, was traded uh, from the Rams to the Ravens for a uh, 2026 seventh round pick. He was traded with a 2027 seventh to the um, to Baltimore for uh, 2026 seventh. So there's a change of scenery for that. And so, oh, I forgot to mention Zadaria Smith um, was traded to Cleveland as well for um, a fifth and a sixth in 25 and 26. So not a, a huge day name-wise. Marshawn Lattimore is clearly the biggest, um, clearly the biggest name that got moved. I think the, the biggest concern for me is that this team, the Packers, do get younger yet again, and they don't bring in any additional reinforcements for a, for a defensive line that hasn't been that good this year. And so, obviously, like Preston wasn't anything to to write home about either, as not not to be mean about it, but he just wasn't what he was at, like like two years ago. And so, how, what it, what is the the realistic plan for for this team to 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 improve the D-line going forward. Because I think like probably one of the biggest things for for Preston was just the new defense probably had was a bit harder to adjust to. And so you're relying on Brenton Cox Jr. and Lucas Van Ness and JJ Anibari to really pick up the slack off the edge. Maybe Jeff Hathaway gets a little more creative with his blitz packages and then and, and does some more that way. But they they don't get help at corner with Marshawn Lattimore and some other players that were um that were available and then they I think they were rumored to um about Aziz uh Olahari over in uh New York with the Giants but he ends up staying put him and his his six sacks so I'm, I'm a little concerned about still about corner and about about edge rushing but I think they're still in a good spot I just worry about effectiveness and and health effectiveness at the on the edge and health at the corner position yeah i think the biggest (laughs) no one wants to hear internal solutions to a team that has been pretty lax in their overall pass rush i obviously subtracting someone that's like preston who, yeah, the results weren't on the level of what they had been. The just be on the field wasn't obviously the same either. But I would say, as we were talking about this time last year with the Razul Douglas trade, is what does that mean for the locker room? What does it mean to lose a big voice, to, to lose someone that, he had been there as long as Matt LaFleur had been. So I believe it's now down to Jair Ellen Jenkins. Um, oh, brother. What are you trying to remember? Jair, who has been with Matt LaFleur since he came to Green Bay? Oh, God. Elton Jenkins, uh, Jair, and I think that's it. I'll bring. I, I thought I saw a tweet that it was. There's two more, and I'm forgetting. I don't know who it'd be. I there's nobody in, on like the specialist. It's not Jordan Love. It's nobody else on the line. I got it. Kenny Clark. Kenny Clark. Yep. And Rashawn Gary. Oh, yep. 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 That was from Wes Hotkowitz, of course, of Packers.com. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, I think this one obviously feel it. It's still queasy. Last year, I mean, we were both very uh, upset with the result of this trade. I, I feel like we felt like that would not submarine the season, but we were very much in. This is a young team. You're trading one of its leaders. If you have any chance of. <laughs> storming back this season, you need Razul Douglas, especially with how well he was playing. So there was the on the field and off the field. Like it was as much as they saved money, it was it was not it was very minimal compared to what other things they think we were talking about at the time. Right. That that trade was more compensation based then than yeah. than, than salary cap motivated. Whereas yeah, it's not the greatest of solutions, but I do think there's at least more promise with where the ad rushers are with anybody in year three with Van Ness in year two, Aaron Mosby. I mean, largely a special teamers, but they clearly like him. He's getting a, at least got five snaps, but <laughs> it's still something. And obviously we've talked about Brendan Cox Jr. Is, he's made the roster the last few years, largely in this kind of, break glass in case of emergency kind of role and now yeah hey. All, almost always the inactive on on the day of he's one of the two yeah. left off of the 51 man game day uh roster of their total 53 men and not for nothing but uh is it jamin jamin davis yeah i'm not gonna tell you how to pronounce it that would be yeah. advised of me um <laughs> packers obviously just signed him to the practice squad last week from after getting after he was cut by washington that just seems like another guy Taylor made to add into the into the defensive field that last rush spot if they so choose. But it it's not I, I just think a lot of it is just kind of a it's just down the middle. There's no there is certainly I, I'm not um shocked. I'm not elated. I'm not like it's just kind of like, huh, okay. You just kind of roll with it. I, I yeah. I think watching Brian Gutekunst's press conference today, I've said of you know there obviously wasn't the big fish that they were people always want to put him towards and obviously kind of shake up the season, but it's just stuff like develops and it, if they feel like the opportunity to recoup even if it's a seventh round pick, they're like okay well. We feel like that's the opportunity cost, and then we have the guys to come in and um, potentially take over that void because, again, it's not the fault of Preston Smith, but on the whole, there there is something to jumble up with how the edge rushers have been playing, the pass rush has been playing. Right. Totally agree. Totally, totally agree. And, and for context, um, this season thus far, uh, the Packers have uh, their first – through sixth round picks and they have a comp pick um in the seventh round and then add in this uh seventh round pick from the uh from the Pittsburgh Steelers. So just whatever it may be. They they don't have a, a plethora of picks this year. They they just have now now eight. So a, a good chunk for sure. But I wouldn't be surprised if they just keep all those picks and, and keep the, the team young and get get new guys in there kind of thing. So um, but yeah, not, not a huge treasure drove of, of picks for the Packers. Um, I'm there. You had talked about that, that 53rd man spot. Uh, Goody did talk in his press conference that, that, that spot could go to Marshawn Lloyd, who they expect to come off of, um, IR soon. That makes it very complicated in the backfield. I, I worry as a, as a teary-eyed fan about Emmanuel Wilson's role in the offense if they're already phasing him out instead of in favor of Chris Brooks. I would imagine they would hopefully put Chris Brooks to the practice squad or wave him and see if they can get him back there. But they're not going to carry four running backs. You're just not. It's just not a good idea. And so how how however long it takes for him to be activated from off of the IR and within that three week practice window is yet to be seen. But I think to your point, I, Jamin Davis, I can't, I'm not, I don't know how to pronounce his first name. Um, probably is a good candidate for that 53rd man 
for the next three weeks that they that they play against the Bears. Why can't I think of who they play? The Bears, the somebody else, the Dolphins, and then who do they, who do they play after the Bears? Do you know? I'm looking up right now. Cause I had it memorized. Cause it's oh, it's the Seahawks, I think. Bears, Niners, Niners. Dolphins, Lions, and then the Seahawks after that, right? Then Seahawks, yep. Saints, Vikings, Bears, and so they're probably going to need edge rushers against the Niners. That's for damn sure. And so, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they if they um, they promote him, and then whenever Marshawn Lloyd gets healthy, I'm I'm guessing they're going to give him some run. I mean, I I can't say how good of an idea that is right now. He's got fresh legs, which will, which would will be helpful for a push towards the playoffs. But um, I think that is very telling that Goody is like, yeah, we plan on getting him back soon. And he's a good candidate for that spot. I'd imagine that's probably who gets that, that spot then. Yeah. I mean, there, there'll be other opportunities to make moves, mm-hmm. obviously, but yeah, it's, one, it would be nice to see him fully healthy after all the struggles that he had personally going yeah. into the season, training camp, OTAs, whatever. It just felt like he was very snake bitten with injuries. So if he's on the mend and fully healthy, let's kind of turn him loose and see what he can do down the stretch run. Yeah, uh, I'm fine with that. So, all right, let's get into a bit more of um, of Go- uh, Brian Gutenkunz's comments uh, from his press conference today. Uh, talking about the uh, return on investment from uh, Xavier McKinney and Josh Jacobs. Quote, not unexpected. They're proven players in the league. Credit to those guys for contributing as quickly as they have. How they have fit into the locker room as leaders. I think that role, I mean, end quote. I think that role as leaders is going to be exacerbated now that Preston Smith is gone. I think those two guys, along with Jordan Love and probably someone else on the offense, I'd probably say Elton Jenkins, are going to be the, the need to be those leaders in the in the locker room without Preston there. But I mean, talk about two home runs of a, of a free agency and Xavier McKinney and Josh Jacobs. Like, I don't think he could be any happier than he is about, about those two guys thus far this season. Yeah. I mean, it's worked out like gangbusters so far. And the fact that both have had, um, gargantuan impacts of obviously McKinney is the kind of, favorite so far but josh jacobs has provided a lot of balance to the offense especially when it's buttered whether because of jordan love or just receiver drops down to your wings or oh, whatever man. like it just i gotta pull that set up keep going it just felt like josh jacobs has kind of been this um i, I already said balance so i'll just keep saying balance <laughs> he's helped it kind of steer it towards keeping things moving I, again the lions game he was doing a lot in very terrible conditions and it helped things work when they were working at least <laughs> that tibian wicks briefly having a, a tough go with this season he has 42 targets and 16 catches it's not ideal whatsoever and so We'll talk more about that um, next week. We're going to have a little mailbag for you guys. So send us your questions on Twitter in the Discord, which you can find at gspn.substack.com in the About section of the G- of the, uh, the Substack. Send us your questions about the Packers. We'll be happy to answer them in our mailbag next week. But uh, I sort of, sort of moving on moving on from that, um, Brian Gutekunst on Edger Cooper, quote, when, we, when, put, when we put him on the field, he makes dynamic plays. When he's out there, you just uh, you feel him out there. Yeah, I mean, he's been great. I'm curious as to when he's going to start getting the the lion's share of snaps on this this defensive side of the ball, and I'm sure you guys will have questions about that for the mailbag. So I'll, I'll leave it that for for our pod next week. But I'm glad to see that um, he, Goody recognizes that as well. I I do like this this next line of questioning. I forget who who asked it, but they talked about um, about Jordan Love and just the quarterback room in general. So first, uh, Goody had said, uh, when asked like how he felt about uh, Jordan Love's season thus far, he said, quote, 
good. He's dealt with uh, his interruptions. He's unflappable. Our offense has been explosive at times because of him. He said, again, we as a football team are working to becoming a complete team and a team that can win situational football, and we're not there yet. End quote. Um, he deflected a, a question about Jordan Love's decision making and told him it said that'd be a better question for head coach Matt LaFleur. Um, and he said that, but obviously, like, I'm sure Jordan and the rest of the offense and the team want some of those interceptions back. Um, but when, I, I, again, somebody else asked the question and they had talked about how they uh, think the, the Malik Willis trade is probably a season saving trade for the Packers, given how Malik Willis has, has performed in his three appearances in games thus far this season and Goody had um I think he was asked does did, has Malik Willis exceeded the expectations when you made that trade um earlier this season he said quote we weren't expected um uh, to have him be pressed into duty as quickly as he had to but credit to Malik and the coaching staff for putting a game plan around him we liked him as a player and as a skill and liked him as a player and his skill set and the ability to win with his arms and legs he's a great kid and really fits what we want here that part you don't know until the player comes into the building, end quote. And I think, like, that that's... Uh, calling it a season-saving trade, I don't think is hyperbole. I think without those two... I mean, can you imagine rolling out Sean Clifford or Michael Pratt against the Titans and the Saints? It would have been a massacre. Or the Jaguars. Or the Jaguars in the second With half. With how that game was going? Yeah, I don't I don't think... He's, I, won, he's won as many games as Jordan Love has this year. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. <laughs> so, yeah, I was just sorry. I'm going to sidetrack off of your point because no, go for it. I, I totally agree with you about Malik Willis. I was just, it is always just funny, like listening to like the reporters, like you feel like you can hear their tone of voice and how they talk to Brian Gutekunst. But Jason Wilde is just always like, Brian, we talked about <laughs> Malik Willis. We talked about these things, like just this like caring but like kind of like <laughs> pa ag passive aggressive reprimand we talked about the ways jordan can get better and and how he can um improve his throwing and and like just do it he does this all the time it makes me laugh as i'm listening to these um uh press conferences so i just had to get these thoughts out because it just makes me laugh um anyway Malik, yeah Malik Willis again we <laughs> sidestep it because of the fact that Jordan Love has played he's missed games but and is currently hobbled <laughs> but um again just would not be anywhere where they are without Malik Willis being there and it's been a nice fun dimension to have to this team whereas yeah, when that trade happened and then when the injury happened in Sao Paulo for Jordan Love, it was like, we're really turning to a guy that has been in this room for two weeks. And I was on our uh, crossover pod with Malcolm and Tyler were for the Lions game. I was like, if you're if Jordan Love is not healthy or fully healthy, I would not be afraid to throw out Malik Willis. And it's like, I could not imagine saying a sentence like that at the start of the season after roster cutdowns and all this stuff. I'm just like, yeah, we don't really know much about him outside of that. He didn't play well in Tennessee, lost his starting job or lost the backup job to Mason Rudolph, but I guess this is going to work. <laughs> so yeah, that, that, um, I, I think to, to segue into another point, I think this is a big point that we hit on from last year's trade deadline. And it's kind of the side note with obviously the press and stuff is like, who is going to fill this leadership void? And it's a really young team. The only two 30 year old players are Brandon McManus, a kicker. So what five snaps plus kickoffs, maybe. Um, and Eric Wilson, who obviously is having more of a extensive expanded role with Quay Walker, in and out of the lineup the last mm -hmm. couple of games. Right. That being said, whether it's guys like Xavier McKinney, Josh Jacobs, or, you know, kind of building this program out with, the again, the, the surplus of these big draft classes that the Packers have had the last couple of years, there, there is kind of consistency bringing in different players. Like, again, Malik Willis had been 
in an NFL locker room for the last couple of years knows what it is like to be a pro and, you know, didn't really know winning until coming to Green Bay, but still, like, those things matter. And I think, yes, there are questions about the Packers' youth and turning that into ready-made qualities of, you know, it's not going to torpedo their season. Um, probably more importantly, it's you need kind of calm, collected heads to create and stage a big playoff run. Mm-hmm. I, I just think it's really interesting that, again, you take out someone that is of experience and was in your, at least your starting lineup, and they're making this calculated effort that, hey, from what we have seen from all these guys and how the team has come together, even if, you know, injuries or other things are at play of why it hasn't come together completely in terms of, like, becoming an elite team, we're still very confident of what they have. And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting what... Whether you believe that or not, it's interesting to continue to make that call, especially with where they're at. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with all of it, all of it. Um, anything else? I, I know, I guess before we totally wrap up, Goody had to say about the, the second half expectations. He said, quote, I think consistency. To be better at situation football, to be in the playoffs, contending for championships, you have to be that kind of that kind of team. We're working towards that. You have to be able to call on that when you need it, and I think that that kind of puts the bow on what they've been doing in the first half of their of their season. They are not a complete team at the moment. They they have a lot of holes that need to get filled, particularly like we talked about at the D line and the edge rushers, and then this cleaning up all the mistakes they've had um, with penalties. But if they can find some consistency on the line. And then just be a a solid minded football team. I think they're in a good spot. I think so too. I think I think the big thing that Brian Gutekunst is bringing up was situational football, and you could take that a lot of ways. You could take that in terms of, I mean, I took it as red zone. I, I took it as <laughs> completing your chances. You can you can play in the twenty yard line to the opposite twenty yard line game. But when things get scrunched, short field situations, that kind of thing, the execution has obviously been lacking. But you can flip that with defense of they played the early couple of weeks of playing the turnover game to kind of cover up their mistakes. And when that goes away, what do you have left? What is what is your defensive structure? What is your, you know, way out of or way towards kind of becoming more of a fierce and fearsome defense. So I, I think it's compared to last year, I felt like last year, I remember just writing screeds of just how team building and all this different things. And it's like the Packers are undoubtedly better than where they were going into last year's trade line, deadline and coming out of it. Even right, 100%. not knowing what was to come last year. But it does show you the struggle of the good to great thing. You know, that that's where fine tuning things from kind of the bird's eye view. So like a goody view or like within the locker room, day to day stuff that you're seeing all the time, practice habits. How do you reward guys that are doing the right things and getting them on the field consistently? Which is more of a Matt Lafleur slash coaching staff thing, and it's just really interesting. This is it's football is such a very you want instant reward, you you like instant payoff of everything, but it's still such a calculated game, even for how random it can be. And it's times like when the bye week rolls around or when the trade deadline comes around, it's like when you have that perspective just sh- like shoved in your face. And you're in the season. It's a lot different than us just kind of projecting for eight months during the off season. Like this, this is what could happen. Mm-hmm. It's the only time where you have like kind of like this, like you know, kind of a, a bigger perspective at play when it's actually happening, rather than like just sitting on the sidelines waiting for next season to start, kind of thing. Right. Right. Okay. Um. Anything else? Or should we wrap up this uh, this trade deadline pod? I think we wrap it up. I think overall it was 
I think people are going to be disappointed by what it was, but I think if you count in like yeah. Devonte getting traded, yeah, or who was another big one recently? Um, I closed. There were some of the wide receivers like Deontay Johnson or um, DeAndre Hopkins. DeAndre Hopkins, like there was activity there. Yeah. Like again, the Chiefs are still undefeated, and yeah, that's that's something. DeAndre Hopkins, um, Mike, Mark, Amari Cooper is the other one. Oh yeah, Amari Cooper. There was yeah. So like overall, those, those, like, those were the big ones. It was Marshawn Lattimore, Zadarius Smith, Mark, Amari Cooper, and DeAndre Hopkins and Devonta Adams. Yeah. So I, I think we just focus on the deadline day of like oh like it was nothing. It was kind of small. Po- or, I don't know, not small potatoes, but when <laughs> all pro level guys are getting traded. A couple of weeks ago, yeah, um, it still makes some noise even when we get past the deadline. Exactly. So, all right, folks, that does it for us on this episode. Go check out uh, the Substack for all things GSPN. All your pods ad free for the low, low price of eight dollars a month. Uh, go check out the Bucks feed as uh, Ty Rohan released an episode uh, post uh, the Cavaliers doubleheader. So go check that out. Spoiler alert: they're a little more optimistic about the Bucks at one and six and they were at one and four or whatever they're at. Um go check out the rest of the pods. Check out all the articles we're writing over at the Substack as well. Um appreciate you listening. Send in your questions for next week's mailbag on the Packers th- season so far. We'll answer those in the next episode. And uh that's it. So thank you for listening again. And Jordan, thank you. Thank you.